Get your Bibles, go to 1 Samuel 22, verse 1 and 2. First Samuel 22, just two verses for our consideration. Come to us from the throne of heaven. I don't care what he does. <laughs> he can do whatever he want to do. The scripture that we are about to consider this morning comes to us midstream, a moment in the life of David that is a difficult time, as it were, for him to manage. It does not coincide or even collaborate with what he has been anointed to become, and yet he is there. It is seldom discussed, not like David and Goliath, not like Samuel anointing David to be king. Not like David killing the lion and the bear. Not like David being anointed the third time or second. In fact, he doesn't feel anointed at all. It is possible to be anointed <laughs> and not feel anointed. It is possible to have something in front of you amazing but not know how to get to it. <laughs> It is that kind of moment that is before us in the text. And I will only read two verses to initiate the discussion that we're going to have today. But it is a discussion that the Lord and I have been talking about for you. David left Gath. He didn't just leave, he escaped. He escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. I want to talk just briefly from the subject, the crisis of next. The crisis of next. Somebody say that with me. The crisis of next. Spirit of the living God, I thank you for what you're about to do in this place. 
fall fresh on us like dew in the morning. We wake up and we didn't see it fall, but there it sits on every leaf and branch. We cannot see you fall, but moisten us with your glory. Saturate us with your presence. Endow us with your glory until we look up and everything concerning us has the dewdrops of a morning experience. For some people it was too early to come, but not for you. <laughs> because the dew falls early in the morning. David said, early in the morning will I see thy face. And so we come early and we come hungry and we come ready and we come grateful. Bless us as we go into your word today. Saturate us with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. You know, this, this text brings so much up in my spirit that I scarcely know where to begin. Perhaps I should start with the controversy it evokes in the subject regarding next. Because sometimes now obscures next. And we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We can sense in our spirit that where we are is not all that God has for us. We can sense in our spirit that there is something looming in our future that is brighter than this present danger. But how do we get it? When the evidence all around us now often suggests that this is a moment of chaos and crisis and agony, and yet there is something in our spirit that has us dancing this morning. <laughs> To those casual observers that may have wandered into the service, do not think that we are dancing without trouble. <laughs> Don't think that we are dancing without pain or challenges or adversities or family crisis or financial crisis or emotional crisis. We are dancing in spite <laughs> in fact, the truth of the matter is, when trouble gets worse, we become better. <laughs> better at praising God, better at seeking God, better at honoring God. He becomes the place we go to. He becomes the nourishment that we receive. He becomes the bread on our table. He becomes the water that quenches our thirst. We come down to the well for one water and leave field with another. Because we are in trouble, we are more focused in trouble. Most of what I have learned about God that's worth repeating, I have not learned on the mountaintops, but I have learned them in the valleys of despair. <laughs> in the valleys of agony, and, and yet there is something that keeps us alive. I, I love what David said. He said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? He is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, he acknowledges them. When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, They stumbled and fell. He admits that he's besieged. The host should encamp against me. 
my heart shall not fear, though war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. One thing. <laughs> have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now I've been talking the FIPA this week and I've been preparing for our pastors and leadership conference and I've been thinking about leadership and what does it really mean to be a leader. And, and I am determined that real leaders have to be, as I preached a few weeks ago, steady in the storm, steady in unsteadiness, stable in instability, consistent in crisis, doing, I prophesied as I was commanded. I didn't know whether it was going to work or not, but I prophesied as I was commanded. Can these bones live again? I don't know, but I did what you told me to do. Success for me is not to raise the bones. Success for me is to obey the God that said preach to the bones. It's my job to preach to them. It's your job to raise them. And these are trying times and, 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 and these are difficult times. And, and I will admit that I am even theologically perplexed because on one hand, I hear Jesus say, take no thought of what you should wear and what you should eat and where you should live. It, it, it almost suggests that I should be complacent, detached, relaxed, that just, just don't worry about anything. And he, then he goes on, the apostle Paul says to us, be anxious for nothing but in everything with prayer and supplication make your requests made known unto God and the yeah that thing right there the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall guard your your heart your your mind your emotions I, I need security uh, n not around my body but around my emotions uh, to keep away the anxiety and the depression and the fear. And he's telling me to be anxious for nothing. And yet, on the other hand, the wise man Solomon in Ecclesiastes tells me to look on the ant, you sluggard, and prepare for winter while it's summer not to waste my days in vanity, but to have a strategy that incorporates sustenance for survival. These things seem contradictory one to the other. And then I look at Joseph, whose strategy was so complete that he used the seven years of plenty against the seven years of famine. And he controlled what was next by the way he thought. And when I look at the two things together, I, I get confused because I'm, I'm a strategist by nature. And when Jesus says, take no thought, it goes against everything in me not to take thought. My sister texted us last night and said, be sure you leave your water running. It's gonna freeze. I immediately turn the shower on just real low, just to just, just drip, because uh, we old school. We, that's why you, you have to be over 50 to get texts like that. <laughs> when you're 20, you don't get texts like that, but when you're over 50, you get texts to leave your water running. <laughs> and, 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 and while I believe God for my pipes, and I believe God to take care of my house, I still kept my water. We just came out of a season where there was a national debate about wearing masks, you know? And they said, if you had faith, you, you wouldn't wear them. And I, I believe God. 
But, you know, I noticed that the people who said faith would make them not wear them wore seatbelts. So, I thought if you really had faith, unbuckle your seatbelt. So what does it mean to lead in turbulent times and how does faith express itself in times that are perplexing? It creates stress, not only because of what we are enduring, but does, how does our faith show up in the crisis? What does that look like? And for different people, you will get different answers. Some people say they have so much faith, they don't worry about anything. So they don't have life insurance or health insurance or anything like that. I'm serious. They, they don't worry about anything. They don't go to doctors. They don't worry about anything. They, they could drive on the wrong side of the road. They don't worry about anything. How does faith show up? in a crisis? How, how does faith manifest itself when God himself tells us to be strategic and rewards Joseph for the strategy? And Joseph becomes the prince of Egypt because he's thinking ahead and yet Jesus says, take no thought. But if I only take that phrase without reading the rest of the text, Jesus isn't telling us to be mindless He is not telling us to be mindless. He's telling us not to worry. He's not saying we can't have a strategy. He's telling us not to worry. He's, he, he's managing our emotions against anxiety when the Apostle Paul says be anxious for nothing. It didn't tell you not to want something. It just says not to be anxious about it. Don't allow your emotions to make you frantic just because you have a plan. Are you hearing what I'm saying? One of my favorite quotes out of then Senator uh, Obama, later President Obama wrote a book called The Audacity of Hope and he says, and I quote, I now realize that the presence of doubt doesn't diminish the presence of faith. That it is possible to have doubt. I lost him, Jesus and faith simultaneously. And I don't know why I lost you because I'm talking about you. There is no question that you believe God, but there are still moments that you stay up at night. How does faith show up in our life in the midst of a crisis when the prophecy was positive, but the circumstance has now entered into a season of chaos. David is a leader. He, 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 he is a leader, not because Samuel anointed him. He is a leader. People cannot make you what you are not. Let me give you further reference. God says to Moses, anoint men to be elders that you know to be elders. I cannot make you something by giving you a title or a desk or an office or a position. If you are not that, you are not that. Uh, let me go deeper. A degree doesn't make you a teacher. You can have a degree in education and still not be a teacher. A teacher is something that's in you. Oh, oh I'm gonna go deeper. A ring doesn't make you a wife. You can put a ring on a man's hand, it doesn't make him a husband. You can put a ring on a woman's hand, it doesn't make her a wife. The Bible said, whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing. So she has to be a wife when I find her. If I don't find her a wife, I can't make her. Yeah. 
David is a king. He is a king. He is a leader. But his situations in the text do not reflect the magnitude of his capacity to lead. What do you do when your life don't look like who you are? What do you do when you go through a season in your life that, that stands in the face of your prophecy and mocks it like Ishmael mocking Isaac? And you look out the window and you can see the promise and the problem playing in the same backyard. Have you ever had your promise and your problem playing in the same backyard? There are times, my brothers and sisters, that you preach power and you drive home crying. There are times, my brothers and sisters, that you say to those with whom you have the responsibility of leading, if it's nothing, nothing but your children, don't worry, baby, everything's gonna be okay. And you go to bed and you think, oh, Jesus. Can I get a witness in here? Are there any mamas in here or daddies in here that told the kids, don't worry about it. That's not yours to worry about. It's going to be fine. And you went back and you got in the car and you drove around and around and around in circles saying, such is the moment before us now. For David has come to the cave of Adullam. He has escaped Gath. Gath is a city amongst the Philistines at the time. The Philistines is where David went to hide because the people that he was leading and the army that he was once assigned captain of is now hunting him. Y'all didn't get that. <laughs> His own folks are hunting him to the degree that he is safer with the enemy than he is with the family. <laughs> and I know you can't say anything because your family might be watching on TV. But the holidays are coming and you got mixed emotions about them coming because all of us don't have the kind of families we see on TV and you know they all coming over, inspecting everything, tasting everything, complaining about anything, asking you where, how come you ain't had children, how come you're not married yet, what did you put in this dressing, where did you get this from, what is this supposed to be, this turkey is dry, and you got a deal to the point that you are safer with the enemy than you are with your own that, oh, come on. Everybody's got some folks in their family that you are related to, but you're not kin to. And their rejection of him after his loyalty to them and his service to them and his kindness to them and his endurance and patience for them has driven him to run to Gath. Gath is the place where the giants dwell. Gath is the place where the Philistines live. And he thought they wouldn't recognize him, but he could only stay amongst them so long. Because you can only run so long. And eventually they discovered him, but David is so gifted and so creative that, that, that David feigns himself to be insane or he would have been murdered. Sometime you gotta go crazy to get out of it. 
Y'all don't understand what I'm saying. Sometimes you got to go crazy, not crazy, crazy to get out of it because people are trying to take you out and you just got to flip all the way. I know it's only maybe, maybe, maybe about 10 people in here have ever had somebody push you till you went. I mean, pull your wig off crazy. Uh-huh, yeah. I mean, yank your earrings off crazy. I mean, kick your stilettos off crazy. And say, okay, you want crazy? You got It's not good to push us too far. Don't think because we're anointed, we won't flip on you. Yeah, don't, 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 don't let the hallelujah fool you. I was talking to God, I wasn't talking to you. And if you push me in a corner, don't make me have to show you why he had to anoint me in the first place. Cause I need this anointing. If I don't get this anointing, I told somebody I was messing with one of my children. I said, now, I know who you think she is, but she's not who you think she is. If you push her far enough, you're going to die. She's going to go to foaming on you. If she go to foaming on you, you're going to find out all the muscles in the world ain't going to help you because she's going to go. Is there anybody in here that ever had to go crazy? Because somebody was trying to dominate, control, intimidate, isolate, destroy, curse you, humiliate you, degrade you, and you've been as nice as you knew how to be nice. And finally it gets to a point where you say, that ain't working. I'm going to have to turn into something that I don't even like to be to make you understand. You... You talking to me? You, 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 you. And the king of the Philistines came down and said, why have you summoned me when you can clearly see this man is crazy? I'm just talking about what the text says, and, and <laughs> I, I know that's not politically correct, but that's what the text says, so I'm talking about what the text says. And so David escaped. <laughs> have you ever escaped? Didn't have time to pack. Gotta escape. Didn't have time to do your hair, to get your nails done, get a pedicure, none of that kind of cute stuff like that. No shave, no trim, no line, because I got to escape. The word escape, see the first word was left, and then it says escape. It's one thing to leave, it's another thing to escape. Some of us are here today because we escape. If we'd have kept on the path we were on, we would have been destroyed, but we escaped. And the reason we were dancing, he's my everything, because we were thinking back, remembering how we escaped. Oh. When I start thinking about all the things I escaped and all the near calamities and disasters. When you gotta escape, you gotta escape. Even if you gotta scale down, even, uh, even if you have to downsize, even if you have to give up the palace and live in a cave, when enough is enough, I'll live in a trailer. You're not gonna intimidate me with what you got, cause I can break it down up in here. 
and he escaped to the cave of Adullam. Now, scholars tell us that the cave of Adullam isn't far from the valley he killed Goliath in. It is not far away. So we find David in a place where he thinks, by now, I thought I would be further. I really, for all the things I had to fight, <laughs> I'm not that far from where I started from. It isn't far from where he was anointed to be king. <laughs> and the people he's anointed to be king over are trying to kill him. Because sometimes the people <laughs> you want to help the most seek to destroy you and take his life. He's not far from where he was anointed to be king, but his circumstances seem millions of miles away from his success. And frankly, he is a king in a crisis. And I don't know who this is for, but the Lord told me to tell you you are king. Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. You may be in a cave, but you are a king. So then, I then begin to question in my mind, how can David be a king, Lord, without a kingdom? A leader without a following? A wife without a husband. A husband without a wife. And suddenly I begin to understand by God's standards that, 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 that God doesn't define success by public approval. My circumstances may be in direct contradiction with who I am, but it cannot rob me of who I am. I am a doctor if I don't have an office. I am an architect if I don't have a client. I am a good person even if you don't like me. I do have worth even if you don't recognize it. Your reaction does not determine my identity. He is a king in a cave. I'm, 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 I'm talking to some people today. I'm talking to some people today. You, you, you see, how do we end up in Adullam. Adullam, by the way, means refuge. And you find yourself in a place living like a refugee, running from a king, kingdom that doesn't want you, and an enemy that's trying to kill you. He is in a cave alone, a ruler without a domain. I am. It may not look like it, but I am. You may not follow me, but I'm a leader. You may not acknowledge me, but I'm a leader. You can call me by my name, Jakes. Hey, Jakes, what's going on? Do Say whatever you want to say, but I'm a leader. If it's in you, it's in you. 
I'm not talking to what's around you. I'm talking to what is in you. I don't care what you hide in. If you are, you are what you are. In the middle of it all, David is anointed. But the question comes, can I go deeper? Is anointing enough? He's anointed, but he has no experience. All education doesn't come in institutions. Some education comes through experience. And you can be anointed to be something, but haven't earned the experience to be established on the level that you're in and the distance between his anointing and him actually acquiring that which he is anointed to run requires that he has a body of experiences that temper him in such a way that he learns like Paul how to abase and abound, how to have lack and how to have plenty. He has learned that the state he's in does not define who he is. So we meet him in the cave, his head freshly doused with oil but his mind is void of experience. Experience is no small thing. When your anointing is powerful, your apprenticeship will be painful. Y'all didn't hear what I'm saying. When your anointing is powerful, your apprenticeship will be painful because God won't give that kind of power and not balance it with that kind of pain. The greater the pain, the greater the power. If you're gonna have the power, you gotta be prepared to deal with the pain. The pain is a part of the power. And in fact, you will understand who you are by who hates you. David is hated by a king because he is a king. You're going to have pain that's commensurate, not to your situation, but to your identity. When you are a king, your name will be brought up amongst kings. And don't be surprised if your enemies don't graduate with your anointing to another level and your frustration is commensurate to your anointing, let me break it down plain, new levels bring new devils. When you get to another level, you've got another level of devil to fight. David killed Philistines and now he's had to flee them. He killed their giant and now he has to flee them. He is in Adullam. I almost named this church Adullam Ministries. And before I finish, you're going to see why. He is in Adullam. No one seeks refuge without some element of fear. Yet David has undeniable faith. There is no one in here that, say, that can honestly say that David has no faith because David has thrown rocks at giants. I want to talk to some people in this room that didn't have much to work with, but you worked with what you had and you threw rocks at giants and you ran after stuff that other people were running from and you had the nerve to be indignant, didn't have an AK-47, didn't have a cannon, didn't have a gun, didn't own a chariot. All you had was a bag full of rocks, but you had the nerve to be bold with your bag of rocks and you threw your rocks at the problem till the thing fell down. If I'm talking about you, holla at your boy. So there is no question that you have faith. But you wouldn't run for refuge if you didn't have fear. So there has to be some element of truth to the fact that the presence of fear or doubt 
does not mean that you don't have faith. Let me prove it by the Bible. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I'm, I'm in a doolum because, because I, I, I believe, but I have elements of unbelief. I stretched out on your word and I walked on water, but when I saw the winds and waves, I said, oh my God, I'm walking on water and I begin to sink. So I have both things living in me at the same time. And I don't know whether to fight the Philistines or fight the other uh, voices that are coming up in my head because I got a fight on the inside and a fight on the outside at the same time and every now and then I need a break. Let me get away. Let me regroup. Let me run into a cave. Let me get my head together because I don't know what to do next. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. The crisis is not the current because I have survived this present danger. <laughs> I'm, 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 not, I'm not so worried about this present danger. I got out of it. It was close, Jackie, but I made it. They tried to kill me, but I made it. It broke my heart, but I made it. I hid amongst my enemies, but I made it. I had to go crazy, but I made it. I've been through hell, but I made it. But now that I have survived, my problem is not what I survived, because I made it to safe. A doulum is safe. You can't have refuge in a place that's not safe. How many folks know you're safe? You may not be satisfied, but you're safe. You may not have attained what you hope to attain, but you're safe. You count not yourself to have apprehended, but you're safe. Uh, I want you to rub that in the devil's face because he didn't want you to be safe. If you made it to safe, I want you to take the roof off of this building right now. to praise it. You could have been dead. You could have lost your mind. You could have been destroyed. You got a right to praise him. I said you got a right to praise him. I said you got a right to praise him. I don't care whether they understand it or don't. You got a right to praise him. I don't care whether they like you or don't. You got a right to praise him. I don't care if they roll their eyes at you or don't. You got a right to praise him. Anybody that was on the hit list of hell and you're still here, you need to take a minute and give your God some I may not have the car I want, but I'm safe. I may not wear name brand clothes, but I'm safe. I may not have the house of my dreams or the family I wanted, but I made it to safe. I can't hear you. Make some noise in this place. Yeah, 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 touch three people and tell them I made it past danger. Yeah, I made it, 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 
I made it past danger. I made it past danger. Ain't nobody beating me. Ain't nobody knocking me upside the head. Ain't nobody gonna put me out of my apartment. I made it past danger. I made it past my scary place. I made it moving into another city. I made it, I made it, I figured it out. I got there, I come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. I made it out of my scary place. I'm still here. You praising him about your car. I'm praising him about my safe. You praising him about your palace. I'm praising him because I'm safe. I'm not crazy. I didn't lose my mind. I didn't blow my brains out. I should have been locked up in jail, but I made it to say to God be the glory. It is not this present danger that has me on my knees. It is not my now. It's my next. It is the uncertainty, the instability, the fragility, the vulnerability of not knowing What's next? Is there anybody in here that ever wonders what's next? The, the, the kingdom that God promised me is trying to kill me. The men that I trained under Saul have attacked me and I am running from a king to a cave and I'm here and I'm safe but what keeps me up at night is what's next what's, I can pay my bills I'm okay I'm safe I got some food in the icebox I'm safe when the weather changes I can turn the heat on I'm safe. But what worries me is the crisis of next. A doolum is a good place for a hangover, a layover, but I can't live. In a layover. And, and the Lord told me to tell you why he put you in a doulum. I only read two verses because that's all I need. A doulum is when you find out who you are without them. Oh, y'all don't hear, y'all don't hear how good I'm preaching this morning. A doulum is the place that God puts you in of self-discovery, where you learn to appreciate who you are apart from all the people you thought were going to go with you. A doulum is the place that God puts you in that makes you know I'm a king if I don't have a kingdom. I'm a grown woman. I'm a grown man. I bring something to the table. I'm the CEO of me. I'm the chief executive officer of myself. A doulum is where you learn to have confidence and boldness and self-esteem. A doulum is where you get your courage back. A doulum is where you come out of your coma and you come to yourself and God has proven to you that if nobody is for you, I'm still for you. I'm on your side. I got your back. I fight.
So a dulem is where you get three things. First, you get you back. A dulem is where you find out you are enough. A dulem is where God puts you in a place that you never thought you could get to in all the world and a new normal emerges in your life. And God didn't let you get the kingdom the way you thought you were going to get the kingdom because you weren't ready yet. If God would have given you the kingdom the way you thought you were going to get the kingdom, you would have praised the kingdom. But God put you in a doulum so that when you do get the kingdom, you will praise the God of the kingdom because you will understand that if it had not been for the Lord that was on your side, oh God, I feel like preaching, I would have been swallowed up but thanks be unto God thanks be unto God but thanks be unto God who gives us the victory somebody shout God gave me the victory God gave me the victory Jonathan didn't do it Saul didn't do it Riches didn't do it God gave me the victory if there's anybody in the house that God gave the victory I'm going to give you a chance to identify yourself So the scripture only says three important things. One, David fled and escaped to Adullam. Yeah. Two, his brothers and sisters and family came to where he was. Oh D don't read over that. Oh because they was the folks. <laughs> who never let him into their circle. But God has so turned it around that while David couldn't get in, they had to turn around and come to where he was. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but whatever you're worried about, God said, in your family, I'm going to turn it around. I'm, I'm going to turn it around. You just stay right where I put you. I'm going to bring them to you. I'm going to legitimize you. I'm going to validate you. I'm going to restore unto you the years that the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locust ate up. And if you just be still... They're going to come to you when you have grown enough that he can trust you to bring them. When you aren't so bitter that he cannot bring better. So he puts you in the cave so that when they come, you wouldn't act out on them over what they took you through. <laughs> oh my God, who am I preaching to? He, he said, I gotta give you a layover because you're not ready to land yet. I got to give you a layover so you can get your head together so that when I start pulling your life together, you will be healed enough to receive the people who rejected you. Right now, you're in a state of rejection and you have anger and hostility about how they treated you. But I had to take you through a worse enemy to bring you to a place that you could deal with a lesser enemy. So I let them the other folk try to kill you so that you could measure what they did against what your family did and you'd open up your cave slap somebody say open up your cave they're coming back 
Open up your cave. Open up your safe place. Open it up. They're coming back. Open it up. They're coming back. Open it up. They're coming back. Open it up. 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 So number one, he found, you found you. Number two, your, you found your family. But number three is the one I love the best. There were men in Saul's army that weren't really with Saul. <laughs> Sometimes the hosts that encamps around you is not really in agreement with the attack against you. And God has to let you survive long enough for them to recognize that I've been on the wrong side of this story. And the Bible said that David gathered that no, 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 he didn't gather them. They came to him. That's what the text says. 400 men came to him. And the Bible says they were in three categories. They were distressed. They were in debt. And they were discontented. And they came to him. What comes to you will always be a reflection of where you are. You will always attract what you are. Because David was in distress. And David was in debt. And David was discontented. He drew what he was. Oh, y'all, y'all don't get that. Y'all don't get how good that is. 400 times God multiplied 400 times of what David was. Distress, debt, and discontentment all recognized him. because they could relate to him and they came he you don't see this is what you got to see let me make sure you get it you don't have to go after what's next the lord said what's next is coming to you You just stand right there in a doolum. <laughs> now that you've come to yourself, stop trying to figure it out. Stop trying to work it out. Stop trying to make it happen. Just stand right there in the cave. God said, I, whatever's yours, I'm going to send it to you. <laughs> Whatever I got for you, it's going to come right to you. You ain't going to have to fight for it. You ain't going to have to prove nothing for it. All you got to do is stand there. They're going to find you in your cave. So his self found him. His family found him. His people found him. 400 times where you are. 400 times times more of where you are. And the Bible said when they found him, they made him their leader. Watch this. Watch this. I'm almost done. Here, here, here's the majesty of the moment. David was alone. And now 
in a cave, which really wasn't a cave, but that's another lesson. In a, in a cave, he now has his whole family has come back together through the worst circumstances. God uses the worst stuff to bring about the best results. They have come into realignment in a way they've never been in alignment before. Wait a minute. And, and, and 400 times where he was, these men left Saul heard where David was and came to him with him. At this point, Saul is the greater and David is the lesser. God says, I'm going to draw people whose decisions don't make sense. They're going to leave greater opportunities for connectivity. It's not going to be about cash. It's going to be about connectivity because of all the things you've been through. They know you can relate to them. They are going to come to you and make them your leader, not because of the oil on your head, but because of the experiences you endured. You have earned the right to lead by the things you suffered. Who am I talking to? See, I got, I got an anointing on me for leaders. I got an anointing on me for people who don't even recognize that you're a leader because all you can see is your cave and your situation and your circumstance. But that's where you're getting your credentials. I'm going to show you one more thing and I'm going to be finished. Shanto. God said, before I show you this, he said, I want you to emphasize this point because they don't get it yet. Make sure they get that I am drawing them now. They're coming up the path. They're coming over the rocks. They're coming over the hills. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Some people are following you who never followed you before. Some people are listening at you who never listened at you before. Some people are hooking up with you who were on the other side attacking you. They're switching sides right now. God said he's going to be your vindicator. He's going to be your defense attorney. He's going to stand up for you. You don't have to fight the battle. The battle is not yours. The battle belongs to God. God. Distressed. I said, Lord, that's everything I built my ministry on. That's why I almost called it a doulum. Because I'm anointed to minister to people in distress. I'm anointed to minister to people whose hearts are overwhelmed. I'm anointed to minister to people not only that are in distress, but are in debt. I will turn somebody in debt into a business owner, into an entrepreneur, into a leader in their community. I will take you from welfare to somewhere. I will preach to you until your lights come back on. I will preach to you till you leave the garage apartment and end up owning the whole building. I got an anointing to cause you to prosper that when I start ministering the gospel, my Money comes, influence comes, favor comes, glory comes. There are some people in this room that can testify that ever since you've been eating this word, things have been turning around in your favor. There's an anointing on me, but I had to suffer first. I had to do without work first. I had to dig ditches first. I had to get weak first. But the Bible said after you suffered a while I'll establish you and make you perfect and there's something down in me that I will draw people who are in distress in debt and the third one is the most important discontentment I draw people discontented 
because these are the people who suspect that there's something greater in them. I bet you every person in this church is either walking into your destiny or suspicious that you got a destiny. Your discontentment is a sign from the Spirit that where you are is not where you're going to be. And you're willing to put the work in to go to the next level. If I got that part right, if I understand my anointing, if I understand my gifting, if I understand my glory, holler at me right now. What I got ain't for everybody. I don't worry about my haters. I don't worry about the people who don't get it. They don't understand my numbers. They don't understand it's not for you. Everything God got for me, he's going to bring it to me. He'll make you move. He'll make you change cities. He'll make you come to conferences you've never been to before. You'll change armies. You'll switch sides uh, and the same anointing uh, that's on me uh, is on you. Uh, you are a magnet. Uh, you are a drawing force. Uh, you got power to move stuff. Uh, you just stand still. Uh, it's coming. Uh, slap seven people and tell them it's coming. Uh, Everything you've been praying for, everything you've been waiting on, everything you've been worried about, everything you've been doing without, your money is coming, your family is coming, your people are coming, your kingdom is coming, your influence is coming, your credibility is coming, your strength is coming, your power is coming, your favor is coming coming. Your will is coming. Your fight is coming. Everything. 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 It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Slap somebody say next. Your next is coming. Your next is coming. Your next. what the devil does. He can't stop it from coming. Inflation can't stop it. Recession can't stop it. Racism can't stop it. Genderism can't stop it. Pride can't stop it. Your past can't stop it. What God has for you is for you. God said your next is in the bag. Sarah, the Lord said, the next time you go in that building where Woman Evolve is going to be, take as many women as you can with you. And he said, anoint every seat in that building and pray in the Holy Ghost and stand in the center of it and shout and God's going to draw them from the north, the south, the east, and the west. You ain't got to worry about them coming. 
God said he's going to do the drawing. I don't know who I'm preaching to. In this place, there are people that need a financial breakthrough to build what you're trying to build. But the finances are on their way. I want you to shout like it's already here. Shout like it's already done. Shout like he's already got it. Oh, you playing around. Oh, you playing around. Oh, you can't believe it. You better open your mouth and to this ministry because you are kin to this minister and what God did in my life is just a reflection it's just a commercial and it's just an offering of what he's about to do in your life God is about to flip it all the way around. This is not a sermon, it's a prophecy. This is not a sermon, it's a prophetic utterance. This is not a sermon, it's a word sent from God. The crisis of next is God is bringing your next into your now. Some of you don't have a money problem, you have a people problem. You can't find the right people that you need to be around you, to incubate what God has put inside of you. But God said he's got 400 people. He's going to wrap around your vision. He's going to wrap around what you're trying to build. He's going to wrap it around that school. He's going to wrap it around that business. He's going to wrap it around that nursery. He's going to wrap it around that vision. And they're going to cross over from bigger and better jobs to come to be with you because as you discover who you are your magnetism is going to pull them from where they are slap somebody and say get ready they're coming you haven't met them but they're coming you don't know them but they're coming you haven't seen them but they're coming they're wearing the wrong uniform but they're coming you're a little bit scared of them but they're coming God is about to raise him up now hush and hear me good hush hush hear me good your discontentment that you hide from everybody is not demonic it is prophetic Your discontentment has been placed inside of you to keep you from settling to be less than what you were created to be. Your discontentment is what he uses to give you the courage to cause disruption because if you were contented, you would be passive and you would stay where you are. But God stirred you up and I stirred you up in the middle of the night and you don't know how to talk to people about it because people say, you ought to stay where you are. You got it good, you got it together. You're already established, but you can't settle for that because your spirit knows that your next is not in your now and you're getting right now, both You're getting ready to make a shift. Somebody better get this mic from me because I swear it's burning in my hands. There is going to be a relief.
every discontented person raise your hand every person who's suspicious that there's something else in you raise your hand every person in you that is taunted by the fact that you have not lived your fullest dream you have not climbed your highest mountain you have not done everything that's down inside of you raise your hand and stop being troubled by the discontentment because God is going to use it to draw you out he's going to use it to pull you into exceptionalism if you weren't discontented you would be lazy your discontentment is sent into your life to drive you into your destiny so stop wrestling with it and use it to climb this hill your David is waiting on you your destiny is waiting on you and the crisis of next is broken by the message of now. This word that I have delivered to you now is God's answer to the prayer you've been praying about what's next. God said, you aren't gonna have to make it happen you're gonna get to watch it happen. It's coming in your direction and it's coming soon. 400 times above everything you went through. And when I was studying the text, Dr. James, there was a point that I discovered. These men that came to him and when they came to him, they were in distress, they were in debt, and they were in discontentment. But when he finished with them, by the time we get to Second Chronicles, the Bible does not describe them as being in distress or debt or discontentment. Second Chronicles says that they have become mighty men of valor with swords and force and might and God said what they're going to come to you watch this in seed form of what they're going to be and it is your job to bring about the transformation into what they are capable of being they're going to come distressed in debt and they're going to come discontented but God said you are not to leave them like he sends them nor be discouraged because he didn't send you a finished product he's sending it to you in seed form and you're going to have to turn them into what God wants you to have to rule with so instead of turning them into a gang or a mob he strengthened their skills he mentored their potential and they became mighty men of valor they were never described again the way he found them because the impact of his influence was so great that the more men he gathered, the more he transformed them into what they were going to be. And this is the beginning of the kingdom. That kingdom come. Oh. You are on the verge of ushering in the kingdom. This is bigger than church. This is bigger than church. This is kingdom. This is dominion. This is power. This is a this is a revolution this is an uprising this is a movement don't be depressed
depressed when church folk don't like it because this is bigger than a church this is a revolution shout at me they're going to come to you for transformation but they're going to connect to you from the place of your frustration. You're frustrated about the same things. You're angry about the same things. You're sick of the same things. And they're gonna connect with you because they're tired of being with people who don't get it Who gets it in here? That's why I tell people everywhere there is no place I would rather preach than right here at the potter's house. It is not the size of the room, but I like to preach to people who get it. Holler at me, I get it. Type it on the line. I get it. You wouldn't be watching if you didn't get it. You wouldn't be driving if you didn't get it. You wouldn't be singing if you didn't get it. Some of you moved here because of everybody who moved here, holler at me now. There's my evidence. You are my evidence. You are my adulam. You are my sign that God will make folk move, get up and relocate because they are drawn to what they are kin to. And no weapon, no weapon, somebody better get me, no weapon formed against you shall be able Everybody touch somebody, their shoulder, their arm, their elbow, I don't care what it is. Touch them. If there's nobody to touch where you're watching, just write touch on the screen. Just write touch on the screen, touch, touch, touch. We're coming into agreement. We're coming into agreement around emotional disorders, financial disorders, and disruptive thinking where we are discontented enough to be disruptive enough. Those are the things that brought us into alignment. And your sister don't get it, and your family don't understand it. But you cannot stay where you've been any longer. The reason Elisha left his mom and them is because he knew Elijah had his next. Your next. Is in my mouth. That's what the Bible said meant when it said, believe the words of the prophet and you shall prosper. You only follow somebody when their next, when your next is in their mouth. I don't care whether you black or white or brown or speak English or Spanish or Portuguese. I don't care if you speak Mandarin. I'm still speaking to your necks. There is greatness down inside of you.
I'm not talking about popularity. I'm not talking about fame. I'm talking about greatness. Greatness has nothing to do with crowds. David's crowds will come much later, but his greatness met him in a cave. God said your greatness will meet you in the cave on the run at a time when you felt like you ain't got nobody. That's when God is going to show you. You have not met your people yet. You have not met your people yet. Stop being frustrated with the people you got around you. They're not your people. They're placeholders. Your people are coming. They're moving. They're migrating. Some of you have people in this church that are sitting on the opposite side of the church. You're going to bump into them in the hallway. Your next is being galvanized. Your next is online. Your next is online. Your next is going to inbox you. Your next is going to come walking right into your situation out of nowhere. 400 times because they get it. The person that you're touching is here because they get it. I have members that are Jewish. I have members that came from the Catholic Church. I have members that were Muslims. I have members that came from nobody's church. I have members that are Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterian and Episcopalian. Those were all the uniforms they had on when they walked in. But God is about to do a new thing. Some of them came out of the strip club. Some of them came out of the crack house. Some of them came out of the prison house. Some of them came out of embezzlement. Some of them came out of adultery. Some of them came out of fornication and perversion. But God is about to do a new thing. Squeeze that person. You're connected. You're connected. You're connected. You're connected. My next begins now father I decree and declare that every person that's touching someone has laid hold on their necks it may not be the individual that they're touching but the individual that they're touching is symbolic that God is about to bring within arm's reach what is next in your life and he's going to draw them by the spirit and they're coming the resources are coming that doesn't just mean that you owe people it means you don't have enough to facilitate what you see the resources are coming there are people that are going to come to this year's leadership conference that you're the leader of one. But the people are coming. You got a business and you ain't got nobody employed but you and your wife. But the help is coming. God is getting ready to transition and revolutionize your life. I may not finish it, but I'm the one to set it off. I may only plant it and somebody else water it and God gives the increase, but I have an anointing on my life to set it off. Your next begins right now. Squeeze that person right now. I don't care what your emotions say. I don't care what your feelings say. I don't care about your isolation. I don't care about your frustration. I don't care who tried to kill you yesterday. You survived all of that for what is about to happen now. 
I decree and declare it will happen not many days since the beginning of the revolution shall start before January 1. God said, I will not wait on your calendar. I'm going to start your new year in the old year. I'm going to start pulling them around you right now. I'm going to set it off now. Be still and know that I am God in the name of Jesus. Heads bowed, eyes closed, every person go for themselves. 30 seconds of inner reflection. Who am I? What's in me? I'm a wife with no ring. I'm a husband with no wife. I'm a mother though I have no children. I'm a leader though I have no people following. I am what God says I am. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I am. I don't need other people following me to validate me. I am. I have come to myself. I recognize myself. God let me escape death. And though it looks like that I haven't gone very far, I may not be far geographically, but I'm very far experientially. I'm not nearly who I was. A new awareness now lives in me. And because I have found myself, I will find my family and, I, and, I, and my crowd will find me.